Right. Good morning, everybody. Let's get started with Tuesday's plenary. Uh, welcome. Welcome to Tuesday. Welcome to day two. Um, all right. So this morning, I'm just going to do a couple uh, reminder slides. Then we're going to have a talk from Geno. It's going to talk about what the LSST Discovery Alliance is up to. Then we go into the ever popular lightning stories. We have four lightning stories speakers this year. These are designed just to help us get to know each other a little bit better. So we'll hear from four speakers um, that are working either on the Rubin project or they're working in the Rubin science community. Then we will end with the, the very popular student poster flash talks. All of the students who are giving a poster here on any of the days, they've all been invited to do like a 30 second single slide advertisement for their poster. So we're gonna run through all of those um, and enjoy what they've prepared for us. Um, all right, as a reminder, we do have a code of conduct. We have three people who serve as code of conduct contacts. So if you do witness or experience um, any violations of our code of conduct, please do reach out to these people. They're ready to um, talk with you about your experiences. Quick reminder to check name tags, check for those social battery pins, um, and yep, continue to have a good time. Wear a mask if you want to, of course, at all times. Um, for our virtual participants, so far everyone's been pretty good staying muted when they're not speaking. Um, we use the microphones in the room. We've got Slack as our venue for, for questions. Um, and then, yeah, I think we're all set up in this room with Zoom share screen, so that's okay. Uh, as another reminder, we have um, meeting room capacities are on the website. You can get to them directly via the short link that's um, posted up at upper right. You can watch these in the morning to see how the plenary rooms are filling up. As you do come into the room, try to move to the middle of the room to allow um, spaces for latecomers along the aisle. And uh, you can sort of look at your how your day is setting up. So you can choose the plenary room for the first session based on the breakout session that you want to be in in the second session. As another reminder for lunch, I've heard that DoorDash worked really well yesterday. If you use the instructions on the website, which you can find under meal options, there's a, a direct, so copy pasteable line in there for instructions to give the delivery driver. They will take your lunch to the check-in desk in the SUSB and it will just be there for you to pick up. Um, and apparently it worked really well yesterday. So um, go ahead and try that as an option to the Slack Cafe or as an option to walking anywhere at lunchtime. What else? Oh yeah, today today is the very exciting day, right? So we just had the summit virtual tour. Um, I'm pretty sure it was recorded. And so we're thinking about playing it again tomorrow morning in this room at 8.15. So if you missed the live summit tour, you can watch the recording um, with everyone tomorrow morning. Then we're in sessions all day today. After the last session ends at 5.30 um, and before the reception, head out, put on your shirt, go out to the fountain and we're going to do the group photo at that time. Um, that's always a lot of fun. If you're attending virtually, there's a way to contribute. Yeah, uh, you've got the short link right here, ls.sc slash rcw 2024. Go there, you can upload your photos so that we can capture our virtual participants as well. After the that, after we do the group photo, there's an evening reception. It's at the Slack Cafe, so there'll be both indoor and outdoor space to mingle, to snack, to have a beverage. It's going to be fun. And the fun doesn't even stop there this year. Uh, we're going to have an evening star party. So several people are coming from SETI. They've got these small, compact, really slick little telescopes that I got to preview on Sunday night. And so now I'm very excited for tonight. They work really well. And so do stay afterwards as it gets dark and then join our, our friends from SETI for the evening star party. Um, I'm, I'm pretty pumped for this. Uh, and... Uh, still not all. Tomorrow, just as a preview for tomorrow, the special things that happen on the Wednesday are the unconference in the afternoon. So do make sure you visit the board, the unconference board in the SUSB building, pop up some ideas, vote on other people's ideas. The rooms and topics for the unconference will be posted by the end of lunch. It'll be in Slack. It'll be on the website. You'll find it. And then after sessions at the end of day on Wednesday, so after the unconference, um, Wednesday, 5.30 p.m., there is a Slack um, control room open house happening. So the people who are observing um, or using the telescope 
on the summit uh, are doing it remotely from here, from this building. So you can um, follow these directions and go kind of look over their shoulder and see what summit operations are like these days uh, at Rubin Observatory. Yeah, okay, so that ends our, our sort of welcome and reminders. Now we're gonna turn it over to Jeno and we'll switch to her slides with the help of Nina. We're on, this is on, right? Do it by hand there. Yeah. Great. Hi, everyone. So, yesterday morning, you got an update on the federally funded Rubin Observatory project from Bob Blum. And tomorrow morning, you'll get an update on the from the eight independent self organized science collaborations. So this morning, I will start us off by a, with a very brief introduction to a third main component of the LSST ecosystem. That's the LSST Discovery Alliance, until last year, known as LSST Corporation. While I'm talking, I want you to remember two things. One, at any point, your organization can join the Discovery Alliance. Second thing is that our programs are designed for you, researchers and students who will be doing science with LSST data. As I mentioned, the Rubin, the LSST ecosystem has three main components, the Rubin project, which is building the observatory and will operate the survey, the science collaborations, which are the LSSD science collaborations, are communities of individuals working on LST, LSST science, and these are organized by science area. Then we have the LSST Discovery Alliance, my organization, which is a nonprofit consortium of institutions that are particularly strongly invested at an institutional level or at a departmental level in LSST science and making sure that Rubin Observatory is a success for the community and for the researchers and students at their institutions. Our organization has quite a history. In fact, it was formed in 2003, so more than 20 years ago, to help initiate or to actually initiate the large, what was called at that time, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope Project, and also to advance the science of astronomy and uh, physics. That early LSST corporation was just two universities, a foundation, and Aura via Noir Lab. Now, since uh, Rubin Observatory LSST is very clearly initiated and in fact uh, uh, almost complete with the construction. The Discovery Alliance has focused squarely on nurturing the science capabilities of you, the researchers and students. At a high level, our goal as the Discovery Alliance is to maximize Rubin science through innovative programs that remove barriers to discovery with LSST, whether those barriers are a need for tools or some additional training or just some additional funding. In particular, what we do is develop and implement bold interconnected programs that deliver those needed aspects 
training, uh, resources such as software tools, scientific networks, and some expertise. And by expertise, I'm thinking of things outside of your own department. So for example, maybe some software engineering expertise. We even work with social scientists who study the, actual, the practice of science who are available to you. How we do this is through close collaboration with the Rubin Project, with the science collaborations and our member institutions, and by using private funding to, uh, from various, in particular, foundations and uh, corporations and individuals. We're also supported our operations by dues from our member institutions. Some of the foundations that are generously supporting our programs right now are listed at the bottom here. Schmidt Futures, the Brinson Foundation, Heising Simons, the John Templeton Foundation, Research Corporation for Scientific Advancement, and the Moore Foundation. Our current member institutions are listed on this grid. I mostly just wanna show you here that there's a wide variety. So some national labs, international institutions, uh, some consortia, one foundation, um, both small and large institutions in and out of the US. So let me go over our, some of our current programs. Our flagship programs are our largest programs. And here are three key ones. The Catalyst Fellowship, which is a unique three or four year to four year fellowship fellowship program that provides structured mentorship and leadership training, primarily through uh, mentoring committees for the postdoctoral fellows. And I wanna point out that this funds mostly astrophysics postdocs, but a few social science postdocs as well that can collaborate with the community and might be at some point reaching out to you for doing surveys. Um, through this program, we also have pro provided to date a million dollars to mid-career or senior researchers in this ecosystem that are serving on these mentoring committees for the postdoctoral fellows to help them learn about the science collaboration. And many of these mentors are active in the science collaborations. We also have a major program linked frameworks, which is an ambitious five-year program to develop software infrastructure to help the community to analyze the high, high volume and complex Rubin data. The PIs of that program, which is funded by Schmidt Futures, is our Andy Connolly at University of Washington and Rachel Mandelbaum at Carnegie Mellon. And I oversee the LSST Discovery Alliance involvement in that effort. We also have run for quite a few years a data science fellowship program out of Northwestern, where the director of that program is Adam Miller. And this is an innovative supplemental grad student training program that gives diverse cohorts of astronomy students, some essential skills with large and complex data sets. In addition to these large programs, which I should mention are all integrated into something that we call LINK, which you might've heard of, that stands for the LSST Interdisciplinary Network for Collaboration and Computing. Um, we also have some supporting programs currently the Science Catalyst Grants Program, which used to be referred to as Enabling Science. You might be familiar with it under that name, which issues peri periodic calls for small grants pro proposals to provide members with agile and timely support to prepare for LSST. We have several in inclusive collaboration initiatives. Some folks here might even be here in part because we offer childcare support, grants to enable parents um, better participate in the scientific process, um, as well as some other aspects of that program. And last, but by far not least, the summer student program, which is for uh, undergraduate students, some of them doing research for the first time, but definitely doing research related to LSST, to come together over the summer at this annual meeting, get to know each other, hopefully form some networks that will be valuable for them as they continue to do LSST research, and they present their work here. So at the end of this session, you will hear the lightning talks from those students, um, most of whom are from LSST member institutions or other small or uh, under-resourced institutions. As I wrap up, I wanna mention that we, uh, the Discovery Alliance is conducting a survey 
please, please, before you leave this workshop, fill out this survey. It will take less than 10 minutes. It has 13 questions. And this will help us with our fundraising. Working When we go to a private uh, foundation or a potential donor, um, it really is helpful to have the data to say whether it's 70% of the community feels they need more of X to do, be successful, this is really helpful. So if you can go to our website, scan in this QR code, or just go to the LSST Discovery Alliance, the first new, news item, blast through that survey, that could end up leading for more um, of these various types of flexible, innovative research funds that uh, we can provide. And uh, to learn more about the Discovery Alliance, go here. Um, and I want to emphasize that everything we do is in collaboration with the Rubin folks, with the science collaboration, and is designed to enhance and complement what they're doing. And we appreciate that continuing collaboration to fill the gaps and understand the needs of the community. So if you can fill out that survey, that will help us. And I want to just end with thanking our many funders for our programs. All right, we'll take some questions. There was one on the Slack, whether the Catalyst Fellowships are gonna be offered in the fall. So we are currently uh, actively fundraising for, most, uh, for the next cohort. It's our, one of our top fundraising priorities. Um, one of our partners has indicated that after First Light, they wanna, since we got started quite early, are interested in waiting until First Light. So I'm not sure if we'll be able to offer, put out a call this coming fall, but hopefully the fall after that. Thank you, thank you, Jeno, thanks very much. Right. Another round of applause for Jenna while we swap over. All right, next up is our lightning stories that were coordinated by Stephanie Deppa, and she's gonna give you an intro to the speakers. All right, as I'm introducing the lightning stories, I'll ask our four speakers to come and uh, line up along the side here so we can keep keep things going efficiently. Um, so uh, as a quick introduction to the lightning story initiative, this is a um, initiative during the Rubin Community Workshop that is put on by the Education and Public Outreach Team as a way to introduce some of the um, folks in the Rubin community that you all work with um, and give them a chance to introduce themselves in a little more depth. These will be um, three slides and five minute talks by some of your colleagues uh, as a way for you to get to know them a little bit better. And so this year we have four speakers um, and they will kind of file through. We, I don't think we will have questions during this period, but um, if uh, any of them, uh, if you want to talk to any of them more, um, I'm sure they will be willing after the session and throughout the week um, to talk more with you. Uh, and uh, with that, I will introduce our first speaker, Azalee. Awesome, thanks. Um... Okay. So my name is Osalie Bostrom. Um, you just heard Jenna talk about the Catalyst Fellow Program. I am a Catalyst Fellow. Um, I'm currently at University of Arizona, and I'm just starting my third year of the fellowship. 
So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my journey. You can see it's been a long one all across the US. I have not done international moves, but uh, I don't know, maybe that comes in the future. So my basic philosophy in life is that you should always have a plan, but that plan can change. And so you can see that many times my plan has changed, but I promise there was always a plan. Um, so my original life plan as an undergraduate at Vassar College was that I was gonna be a high school math teacher. I graduated with my secondary teaching certification, a degree in mathematics. And then I was like, I'm not quite sure I'm ready to go into the classroom yet. Maybe I'll do a master's degree. Astronomy seems really cool. So I started a master's degree program at San Diego State, and I really fell in love with research and astronomy there and decided to switch career paths. So I graduated right as servicing mission four was happening for the Hubble Space Telescope and got a job at the Space Telescope Science Institute as a research and instrument analyst. Um, I worked on the UV spectrographs, and there I really developed um, uh, appreciation for documentation, for pipelines, for public data access that I think I've carried forward um, into my research career. So ultimately, I decided that I would like to keep doing astronomy, but I'd like to be a little bit closer to my family who all live here in California. So I moved uh, westward um, and thought to do that, I would probably have need to have a PhD. So um, I went to UC Davis and started um, learning about supernova and massive stars, and that really started the research that I'm continuing to pursue. Um, since then, I've been a Dirac fellow at University of Washington, and now I'm at University of Arizona. Outside of astronomy, I love gardening. I have a vegetable garden, even in Tucson, um, baking, and then also getting outside, biking, hiking. And then my cats I've had with me since San Diego. They're 17. They've been all across the country with me. And so they mostly sleep, but we hang out a lot. Uh, okay, so thinking about my approach to Ruben and kind of the role that I hope to play here, uh, I'm thinking about kind of three fundamental questions. How can the supernova community best use the Ruben Observatory? And I'm really thinking about beyond cosmology, which I think gets a lot of airtime, but there's a lot of other types of supernova and a lot of other information we can learn. Um, how will the Ruben Observatory change the way that we do science? I think we're approaching this paradigm shift of, you know, gathering data to kind of going to databases. And so thinking about that, how can we help the community prepare for this paradigm shift in the way that we do astronomy? So the two things that I want to tell you about is first on the research side, um, I'm for supernova, I think Ruben is going to be amazing with the baseline that we get. Um, the cadence that we have and the depth, but there's gonna be gaps both in wavelength coverage where you get one filter one night, another filter another night, um, that's gonna make it challenging for transients where we see things change on hours to days time scale. So the two ways that I'm thinking about how do we fill in these gaps in data are um, thinking about creating a gold sample of really well studied nearby supernovae um, that we can then map the Rubin data set onto, and then also thinking about building a grid of hydrodynamic models that we can use to understand the Rubin data. Um, then in terms of preparing the community, um, I've been putting on two Carpentries workshops of the AAS meetings for the last 12 years. Um, the first is a curriculum that I helped develop called Foundations of Astronomical Data Science. This focuses on real research problems and how to use SQL to access and combine two large data sets. We use Gaia and PanStars. Um, and I think that this is a fundamental skill for um, the Rubin era of how, how do we actually query databases. Um, the other is more general coding. Um, reproducibility and automation with shell, version control with Git, and then an introduction to Python if that isn't a coding language you're using. I put up the QR code for the Foundations of Astronomical Data Science, and I'm happy to talk to anyone about any of this in more detail during the breaks. I'm here all week. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Bitts. I'm from Eastern Kentucky University. And uh, my journey uh, is one of uh, shifting gears a little bit late in graduate school. Um, I am the child of two 
uh, astronomers, uh, one with a master, one with a PhD, both of which tried to utterly convince me that if I wasn't passionate about astronomy, I should not follow in their footsteps because in the words of my father, there's just not a lot of money in it and you could do a lot of better with, you know, your time. But here I am anyway, right? I was stubbornly refusing uh and and wanting to do what they did um mostly because of the pretty pictures i mean hey let's let's face it um so i went to uh the institute for astronomy at the university of hawaii at manoa and halfway through my graduate career i got to teach a course for undergraduates and not only did people tell me that i seemed to be good at it but I also found out that I was very passionate about it in a way that uh, I had not felt uh, just from purely uh, approaching it from a research point of view. So I ended up at Eastern Kentucky University. This is a regional institution and it serves uh, a big part of its region in Kentucky Appalachia. And that means that we have, uh, we service one of the most economically depressed regions of the country. But that also brings some opportunities of its own. We have about a 40% uh, uh, undergraduate population that is first generation. And we can have that opportunity to give them their first look at what they could be doing in the fields of research, uh, not just in STEM fields, but in my area with physics and astronomy. And so that is where uh, I kind of approach uh, all of my uh, the aspects of my career is in trying to see how can I turn this into an opportunity to help undergraduates get passionate about research. So just a quick uh, poll here. How many undergraduates do we have in the auditorium right now? How many faculty and staff here who mentor undergraduates in the auditorium? Yeah. And the thing is, there are challenges that you don't have with other uh, levels of uh, career. Unlike faculty, postdocs, and graduate students, undergraduates are going to approach Rubin Research perhaps without prior knowledge and experience. They're just getting off the ground. And that means that we have some unique challenges in trying to get them up to speed, so to speak. And from my own personal uh, experiences when I was an undergraduate that I can still remember even after all this time, the feelings of, I don't want to impose on people because I don't know things. I'm a little hesitant to use up some of their time. Maybe I'm a little bit embarrassed because everyone's throwing this acronym or this term around and I don't understand it and I'm just gonna pretend that I do. There's a lot of things that happen at the undergraduate level that are unique and that we have a chance to address because Ruben's survey is going to have an unprecedented uh, level, not just of the amount of data, the proverbial fire hose that we'll all get a chance to drink from, but also the level of accessibility right off the bat. That's what I'm really excited about. There's going to be a lot of chances for us as mentors and for undergraduates to be able to really get that full project experience not just, oh, there's this little part of my big project that I want you to work on because I don't want to have to deal with it for a while, right? Instead, it's the full, let's go all the way to results. Let's have you produce some projects, some products from your work. So that is what I'm aiming for. And one of the um, organizations that is coalescing right now to address this is what's called the Rubin Undergraduate Network or RUN. And as part of that, this is something that's been itching at the back of my brain for a while now, is that we have this wonderful set of tutorials in the Jupyter Notebooks. I, um, when I first encountered them in uh, the DP0 sessions over this summer and the previous summer, I was like, this is awesome. It's very descriptive, but I think it could be even more directed towards undergraduates, really trying to get to the fundamental layer to train them up, especially if they haven't had any prior experience. Think about first or second year undergraduate students. So if you are curious, if you have your own ideas, if you are an undergraduate or a mentor of undergraduates, please consider 
coming to the session 4 p.m. This is gonna be our session for the Rubin Undergraduate Network. Please give us your ideas, give us your needs. We want to be able to make the undergraduate experience with Rubin one of the best that's ever been for any astronomical survey. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Fernanda, Fernando Rutia. I am the EPO, the Chilean EPO of Rubin Observatory from the, la, the past month. So I will, I will talk about a little bit about me. I study astronomy, my undergrade in the Catholic University in Chile. In this time, the only university that had astronomy for the first year was Catholic. So I say, okay, I have to be, I want to be an astronomer. So I want to go to this university and I start to do my undergrade there. I spent four, five years. I don't remember how many years I spent there, but I finished my undergrad and I moved to Sao Paulo University to do my master thesis. I spent one year there. When I arrived to Sao Paulo, I didn't know nothing about Portuguese and the class in Portuguese, the test was in Portuguese, so I have to learn Portuguese in the first years. After that, I moved to, for one year for the investigation, I moved to Goddard. I spent almost a year there doing the investigation of the master and I come back to University of Sao Paulo to do my the master thesis, master defense. I finished that, I continued doing my PhD in Sao Paulo and I spent that, I did the, the course, I did the uh, qualification exams and I moving again to Goddard for a year. After that I applied for the student chief in the ISO in Gargin, I moved in Gargin and in the same, in the same thing that I, when I went to Sao Paulo, I went to Germany without no German. But doesn't matter in ISO, all the people speak uh, English, so it was no problem there. But uh, it was so stressful the first time because when I arrived, I didn't know to say hi or thank you in German, so it was so hard the first time there. After that, I was say, after that, I finished my, my PhD, I come back to University of Sao Paulo, I have to defend the thesis in Portuguese. I defend the thesis, was all the fine. And I moved to Chile because I want to come back to Chile after all this trip. So, okay, I, can, I have to come back to my home with my family. I went to Chile and I started to be in the commissioning of the uh, T80 telescope in Cerro Tololo. I was in commissioning. This is worries more for engineer. I was astronomer. It was so hard the first time. I know what is a camera. I know what is a filter, but I never saw that. So when they say, okay, Fernanda, the camera is arrived. I don't know. You have a lot of box. The, what happens in the box? I don't know. They have a lot of pieces, but, but things, but I don't know what it was a year, a very interesting year, but I learned a lot. And then the telescope and me was so friend. And we continued. After that, I went to Universidad La Serena. I applied for a grant and I take my grant. It was, um, um, oh, I forget the name. Was a grant, was no postdoc was a research grant with money for have um, a student, a master student. It was so stressful this time because I just finished my PhD. I have to be my own, doing my, my own research, doing a re working with a student it was so hard. It was the hardest years in my, my career to have a student, my research, doing things. So I say, okay, it was two years of research money. So I stopped here in my career of astronomy, and I, in parallel of all these things, I always doing um, education and outreach in all the places that I went. In the beginning, in the undergrad, I was in Física Itinerante. Uh, we went to the school as undergrad student, just showed the, the, in the student, the, the school, the student in the school, the interesting or exciting uh, uh, investigation, uh, experiment that we did during our career. So we are doing that. When I was in Brazil, I do a lot of talks to the student, a start party, it was so funny. In, in Goddard, when I was in Washington, I was not so comfortable with, with my English, so I didn't do a lot of um, outreach, but I went to a library who, who was in a place where more people speak Spanish, so I started to do talk there. When I was in Germany, was my English is no good and my German is worse. 
So I didn't do nothing. I stopped with Aurit. And after that, I met with the people of Galileo Mobile. It's a group of astronomers. I don't know if someone knows them. It's a group of astronomers that go to different countries with Aurit. I was in two programs with them, Constellation in South America. We want to unificate uh, South America with astronomy. We went to several countries with uh, creating a uh, club, uh, club of astronomy in the, in the school, and the school have connection with each other in the, in, uh, across the uh, South America. I was this, we have an expedition. I was in chair of Chile and Ecuador. And after that, I say, okay, I want to do the same thing, but more localizing in Chile. So I create Astro Club, who was the same thing, great club of astronomy in the school, in the region where is the telescope is the Coquimbo regions. I spent that, in, and also in Santiago. I, I was doing all the things in the moment that I was in this point of my career, finished that. I was finished my, the, my research, my two years, I said, okay, I have to uh, apply for other postdoc position. Oh, for, more, for sure, I have to move again. And when I, I, I look behind me, I say, okay, all my life is in only two luggage. All that I have is two luggage. And I don't, I don't want to continue to do that. I want to do it in a fixed position. What, but I didn't have any postdoc, so it was impossible to do that. So, okay, what I have to do? I will stop. I will not continue doing astronomy. I cannot follow that. This is not my life. This is not, I don't want to do that. I want to have family. This is what some, when I was 30, 32, something like that. So, okay, I cannot continue. I will study medicine. I have to spend five years, the same, the same five years that I, I will spend doing a postdoc, moving. Why well, I will study medicine, I will start to apply for medicine. And in the same point, appear a position or EPO in Gemini Observatory in Chile. I apply. What's the first time that I apply for a position that I don't have all the requirements in the application? Say, so, okay, the imposter syndrome will not win this time. I will win, I will apply and get the position. I get the position in the 2017. Gemini moved to another lab in 2019. I spent time doing EPO, education, and outreach and communication. And in the last year, in 2023, my boss said, Fernanda, do you want to start to work with the EPO team in Ruby? I said, yes. I really love the telescope and what they are doing is amazing. I want to do uh, activity with it. So my last year was in Noela was 25 percent for Rubin Education Group. And this year I appeared the position for Chilean EPO and apply and I get the position on June. From June I 100 percent of uh, EPO for Rubin. I am working 100. So what I am doing in the Rubin position I am working in citizen science, but I don't know a lot about that because I just have two meetings with the people or one meeting. So if you have any question of citizen science, go to Claire because she knows more than that. What are we are doing? We are also doing outreach. I just started this, this month. What we are doing with outreach in Chile, I create Astrochella. It's astronomy tab, but with Chilean words. And we have every first, First day of every more in a pub near to the recinto in La Serena, we are doing Astrochella. So if you are in La Serena, any of this Thursday, go join us and you will be so funny. And if you speak Spanish, you can be you, you can you can do a talk. The last talk in July was Marcos Lopez uh, told about the camera and how many dogs can be in the camera, something like that. It was so funny. And what we are doing more in my position in formal education, I am working with a team for more than a year. What we are doing here is a lot of activities for teachers using the classroom. They are amazing activities, so you have to go to, to see our webpage, what we are creating. We are doing a lot of workshops during the year. We have a big, work, work, a big workshop. I, I, I did three the past year in, in Chile, at the escuela with 17 teachers. A workshop in Santiago, another workshop in Santiago with a total more or less 100 teachers. And we just finished one here in Tucson with the first group in the, uh, from the United States. We spent a, a week in Tucson and Kid Peak 
with 24 teachers. It was an amazing experience. So this is what we are doing. This is amazing. If you start asking me 10, de 10 years ago what I want to be when I was grow up, I think this is what I want to do. Doing astronomy, share with, it, with, with the public, and working with, with all the people, with astronomy and the general public. So thank you. Okay, hello. Uh, hi, everyone. My name's Orion. I uh, work at Slack. My pronouns are he, they, or el en español. Um, I'm a software developer, and I've been with Ruben for about two years. Cool. So most of what I work on has something to do with um, data release production. Um, so I'm on the campaign management team. That's data production campaigns. Um, and so Essentially, um, I work on um, science pipelines validation. Um, I work on uh, some software to automate the production of data releases and make, um, you know, when you have a huge production, there's, um, there's a lot of points at which you can, um, you may have to stop and see if you're doing things right, see if you've lost something. Um, and it's, really quite similar to taking data actually because of the process and how intense it is. So um, I work on software to make sure that it goes well and to essentially run the entire thing with the team here um, at Slack. And in addition, um, I also work on some tools to diagnose any issues that might come up in data processing. So it turns out that when you use the science pipelines, they make sort of a graph of all of the things that they're planning on doing um, inputs, outputs, and such. How does each task get all of the data products that it needs in order to actually run and produce the data products that it produces? And those graphs are actually very valuable for how we understand what happened in the entire process from you know, signals from a telescope to galaxy catalogs. And so basically we can use these graphs to diagnose any issues. And if you use the science pipelines, um, this tool is called Pipe Task Report and Pipe, pipe Task Report dash dash help or talk to me because it's my brainchild. Um, okay, also recently I was able to um, volunteer at the summit. I think one of the most exciting things about this position is the variety of things that I've been able to do. Um, so you may know there's another telescope on our hill called Oxtel. Um, it is smaller, it has one of the same detectors that the LSST camera does. And it's been used for a lot of testing um, of procedures and of like pretty much everything, but also it will be um, used for a spectroscopic survey that um, characterizes the atmosphere during observations. And when I came down to uh, Chile, I was able to, um, I was able to volunteer to help observe because the observing specialists were training people and it was a really busy time. Um, so that was really exciting. And I was also able to um, work on some automation for our Oxtel. Um, so it was really fun. I got to dig up some old skills that I had from high school robotics. And uh, the picture here is me wiring, like, wiring uh, relays for the vent gates. Um, okay, so. Um, Weirdly, I did not get here through software or engineering. Um, I actually studied astrophysics. Um, I've done research on galaxy cluster cosmology and on supernova remnants. I'm really good at extra astronomy, but uh, if you wanna talk about my path and how I ended up doing this, uh, please come talk to me. Um, I'm also queer and trans. I'm from the Bay Area. Um, I play music and I rock climb and I do a lot of other things. So anyway, uh, if any of this speaks to you, come talk to me. I'd be happy to meet you and talk about my life. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for organizing all of those speakers. Thanks to all of the speakers as well. All right, we are going to 
that up for yes all right now on to poster flash talks we are running a little behind so this session is going to run over you students you do not have to rush you will all have your time we will just go five to ten minutes over and that's fine so so don't be nervous if you do have to leave like right um, on the hour from this session just get up and wiggle your way out that's okay we understand handing it over to ryan thank you melissa uh good morning my name is ryan okers i'm the director of the discovery alliance's summer student program um, and i'll only be speaking to you for about 30 minutes here so that's just kidding. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that the Rubin Community Workshop puts a lot of emphasis on students, their research, advocating for these students to network with senior researchers, uplifting them, and then promoting their science. And I think that's something that the Rubin community itself should be very proud of as well. Briefly, um, I'll just say that you're going to hear 30-second uh, pitches from 20 undergraduate and graduate students who are doing LSST and Rubin-related research. Their posters are going to be up in two sessions, Monday and Tuesday from 3.30 to 4 in the afternoon, and then Wednesday and Thursday from 3.30 to 4. I encourage you to speak to all of their students, learn about their research, and if you still have it, give them a business card and introduce yourself. It would be really great. They are in Building 53. Um, I did want to quickly highlight that 10 of the undergraduates you're going to hear from today have been completely supported by the Discovery Alliance to attend the Rubin Community Workshop. This includes travel to the workshop, their room and board at the guest house, as well as a small stipend to cover uh, any incidentals. Um, one of the nice parts of the students that are here this year is we were also able to support several students from international institutions, which we're quite proud of. Um, I do want to mention there's a couple things that we try to expand upon in the program. One, we're going to be taking these students to a tour of Lick Observatory tomorrow, and we've set up some nice breakout session that we had on Monday where the students were able to talk to a panel of very talented educators, communicators, scientists, academics um, related to Rubin and talk about how they got to their roles. And we think that it's something that important for the, to emphasize the students how they can sort of expand their career after their undergraduate or graduate um, um, uh, life. And this is something that was open to all students. Um, so I'll just say that if you're interested in this program, either how you can apply, how you can work to expand the program, if you are interested in donating to the program, please come and find me. I would be happy to talk to you about the program. So without that, I'll, I'll have the students stand up and we'll begin the flash talk. So, good. and yeah, if you're a student, please stand up in your row and start coming around so we can do it in order. So yeah, Shras, go ahead. Oh, and uh, please, I realize we are running a little bit short on time, but if you could please just give all the students a small clap, I think it would be really important for them. So. Um, hello, I am Yash Raj Baines. I am a rising senior at San Jose State University. This summer, I was graced with the opportunity to work with the amazing people here at SLAC. Uh, my research addresses the question, how can we optimize existing photometric redshift estimation algorithms in order to prepare for next generation surveys such as LSSC, we ran several algorithms in over 70 different configurations, of which one of the top performers are displayed on this um, slide. If you have any more questions or would like to talk, uh, please visit me at my poster. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Jonathan Calixto. I'm a rising senior at Stanford University. And this summer I'll be working with, uh, or I have been working with uh, Pat Burkett, studying how self-organizing maps can help uh, predict errors in the size of the point spread function due to chromatic seeing. Uh, so far we've trained our SOM on five colors and one magnitude, and we've observed significant correlation between position on the SOM and PSF error size. And if you'd like to know more, please come to my poster later. Hello, my name is Andrea Dourado. Uh, I am an undergraduate student at Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. My research address um, an end-to-end -end study on how to perform a production run of a photometric redshift catalog on Rambi Rubin GP0.2 data with TPZ algorithm. We use rail at Linear Computer Cluster Apollo to perform the algorithm and analyze the individual and ensemble metrics to evaluate the photos equality and optimize the parameters. Uh, to learn more about, come visit me at my post. Thank you.
Hi everyone, I'm Pedro Floriano. I'm from uh, the Universi Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul, uh, in Brazil. Uh, we're working at finding ways to find and catalog uh, global clusters in spiral galaxies. Uh, we're using uh, UMAP and PCA to create uh, color diagrams to find over density regions where we know the GCs are. So after that, we, we do set fitting to get the physical parameters of the candidates. And at the end, we should get like a catalog of all the, the candidates and their physical parameters, the location for any given galaxy. Thank you. Hi, good morning. I'm Sofia Lossky. I'm a rising junior at Columbia University. Uh, throughout the school year and the summer, I've been working to determine whether the Pleiades Star Cluster, AB Duratus Moving Group, and Theia 301 Stellar String are part of an extended structure. As you can see in the figure on the right, our kinematic analysis suggests some potential extended structure. Um, yeah, also conducting some abundance analysis at the moment. Um, if you're interested in learning more, uh, please feel free to come by my poster. Thank you. Hi, my name is Diego Lockyer. I'm a fourth year undergraduate, or an undergraduate entering my fourth year at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Uh, my research focuses on the location of double O radio galaxies in the cosmic web. Uh, as you can see in this figure to the left, we have reconstructed a map of the cosmic web at redshift 0 0.2. I have found that around 23% of radio sources are likely in cosmic filaments. Uh, cut my poster to learn more, thank you. Hello, my name is Matthew Lugatiman. I'm a rising senior from the University of California, Riverside. Uh, my project this summer is working with Dr. Patricia Burchett, uh, Burkett, sorry, on investigating the how differential chromatic refraction affects the shapes of the images of our galaxies. And it, um, what we found is that for air masses greater than 1.4, uh, the relative refraction angle is greater than 1.6. If you'd like to know more, please come visit my poster. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kyle Mo. I'm undergrad at the University of Pittsburgh. And sort of an era of Rubin, the ability to have near real-time classification is vital for larger surveys such as LSST. So in general, my poster is about how we test and train those classifiers in preparation for those surveys. Particularly, I focus on one photometric classifier, Super NOVA, and I talk about how we train it on simulated LSST data, as well as plans to use current infrastructure such as Big Google Broker to test it. So if you'd like to know more, please come find me. I'd love to talk about it. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Logan O'Brien. I'm a master's student at San Jose State University. Um, I'm in Phil Marshall's Strong Lindsay Group here at Slack. And so we're developing a machine learning method to um, automatically uh, model the 10 to the third strong lenses we expect to see from Rubin. And so at the moment, it's just trained with simple uh, mass models for the main deflector, just a single deflector. And so what I'm doing is I'm adding in perturber masses to the subhalo around that main deflector to see if our network can still make accurate predictions with a more complex mass model. And so um, just to see if we need to retrain um, before we start feeding it real data. So thanks. Hello, I'm Bumi Par from Seoul National University. I'm searching for galaxy clusters using our own optical data named KS4 to cover the southern sky where the cluster catalogs are still limited. As a result, we found 5,000 cluster candidates in 950 square degree region, and we're gonna work on the finer 4,500 square degree regions. And uh, this figure is the one example of the regions, and I hope our uh, study will open a wide opportunities for the further studies on, L on the LSSD. Thank you. Hi, my name is Vicente Puga. I'm a recent graduate from Cal Poly SLO. Uh, I'm working with Professor Dr. Edwards and my research focuses on looking at galaxy, uh, sorry, at a color magnitude plot of a galaxy cluster and the specific uh, feature known as a red sequence to find a relationship between that and the redshift and hopefully determine an easier way to solve redshift knowing only the red sequence. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Blayton Robertson. I'm a grad student at the University of Louisville in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, my, in, my research deals with mapping dust attenuation from over, ideal overlapping galaxy pairs and throughout the spiral arms of this galaxy VV191b, and I'm able to constrain the attenuation law in the near infrared and hopefully in other filters as well for many other different galaxies and many other different regions in the specific galaxies themselves. If you have any more questions, please come see me at my poster. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Joseph Santos, a recent gra recently graduated from Rutgers University and under the advisement of Dr. Heather Prince and Professor Eric Weiser, we tackled the question, can we use analytical marginalization to speed up LSST forecasts? Uh, we found that by using the analytical marginalization method described by, oh, I'm going to butcher her name, Hedziskia uh, and everyone else involved with that, we obtained results similar to brute force methods while improving computation time. If you want more uh, information about what I did, please see me at my poster. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Elena. Uh, I'm going to be um, fourth year undergraduate students at the University of Oxford in the fall, uh, where I currently work on lunar science in the Space Instrumentation Group. But since last summer, I've been linked to IPAC, Caltech, um, where we've been working on uh, characterizing parameters for near-Earth asteroids using thermal infrared data from missions like NEWWISE. Um, if you're interested in knowing why is this interesting, why we do this, what are the type of parameters that we can get, and especially how it is linked to LSST, please come by my poster. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tatiana Acero Cuellar. I'm a PhD student at the University of Delaware. Uh, my poster presents a comparative study of seven different deep learning image-based uh, models for real bogus classification. Uh, these models assign a machine learning reliability score to template subtracted sources. So I evaluate these models on the same data set and compare their performance against the Rubin requirements for purity, completeness, and prediction time. So if you want to hear more, uh, please visit my poster tomorrow and Thursday. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Giovanni Carbonara and uh, I'm a researcher at Benedictine University and our research revolves around implementing the distance luminosity function and the apparent magnitude function from Allsing et al. 2018 to calculate values of apparent magnitude of using 740 type 1a supernova data samples from the joint like curve analysis. So what we will be doing is fitting for the six free parameters that the apparent magnitude function is dependent upon to find their optimal data, um, sorry, optimal values using an implemented likelihood function. From there, we will use pipelines developed by fellow catalyst, Dr. Eric Krishna Mutuvalu to um, use massive optimal data compression to increase the efficiency of our code. If you'd like to learn more, please see me at my poster. I am the Wednesday and Thursday session. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Kyle Cook. I'm a graduate student at University of Louisville with Clayton. Um, we are working to combine existing UV data with um, new H1 data to see if we can l further constrain star formation histories, as well as selecting out whether or not galaxies may be quenching or rejuvenating. Um, and if you want to know why I'm at a Rubin conference and excited about the Rubin data, I would love to talk to you on Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm John Franklin Crenshaw. I'm in the final year of my PhD at University of Washington. And the project, I work on the active optic system, and particularly the, uh, the algorithms we use to infer optical aberrations from our out-of-focus images on our wavefront sensors. And over the last year, we've uh, re-implemented all these algorithms and expanded them to make them a lot faster, more robust, uh, more configurable during commissioning. Um, so if you want to hear about all these efforts to prepare us for commissioning the active optics, uh, come by my poster. Hi, I'm Guillaume Megillas. I'm a, a last year PhD student here at Stanford. And if you're still interested in AOS on Rubin, uh, you can come by my poster and we can talk about what we what happens on Rubin after we estimate the wavefront and we go on to the corrections of the systems. And uh, uh, I can go over the 
uh, the generosity approach that we've developed and also all the commissioning preparations that we've been working on. And please come by my poster. Hi everyone, my name is Anna Khalid. I'm a summer research student at Benedictine University. In our project, uh, we take a look at a sample of supernovae data from the joint light curve analysis to test vision analysis pipelines developed by Catalyst Fellow Dr. Ari Krishna Mutuvalu, which we implement using Jupyter Notebook to figure out what could have given rise to the data. We're to figure out what optimal parameter values could have given rise to the data we are an analyzing. If you would like to learn more about me and my project, please come visit me at my poster. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you to the students. I think that's it. So we could give them one more round of applause. That would be great.